Okay, I think we can get started with it, uh, with this session today. Thank you for joining us all. Before we begin, um, I am Luciana Regue, and this is the translation, literary translation 101 uh, session. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the WGA is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota, Stu, Iroquois, the Ojibwe, eh, Anishinaabe, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. I would like to acknowledge the help of Sadie McGilbray, who is helping today with these tech aspects of the event. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, you to our co-host for the night, Dr. Lele Cheng from the Literary Translators Association of Canada. Lele, Dr. Lele Cheng is a literary translator, writer, and scholar. She published the Mandarin version of Stephen Grosby's Nationalism, a very short introduction from Oxford University Press with Nanjing's Yiling Press in 2017 and Hong Kong Oxford University Press in 2020. She's the author of Reorienting China, Travel Writing and Cross-Cultural Understanding from the University of Regina Press in 2016. Her poetry and prose translations and poetry and personal essays appear in literary anthologies, journals, and magazines in Canada and beyond. She teaches at the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta, and currently serves as Vice President Western Canada of the Literary Translators Association of Canada. Lele. Thank you very much, Luciana, for the generous introduction. Um, so it's a great honor again to be able to host this, co-host this event with WGA, Writers Guild of Alberta. Um, so uh, serving as a VP West Canada um, uh, means I'm kind of taking care of Alberta, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, um, and uh, work with uh, literary communities in these four uh, provinces uh, to promote uh, literary translation. Um, so my role, uh, you know, just uh, a couple of things that I've been doing is to work with the LTAC board member. So LTAC is the shortened form for Literary Translators Association of Canada. Uh, working with the board members to promote literary translations uh, in this part of the country. I've been working uh, on attracting new members to the association, revitalizing literary translators community through hosting serious reading events uh, and panel discussions like this one, uh, building partnerships with writers community and other literary communities. Um, so this is the second translation panel discussion co-hosted with the WDA. So the first event happened in May 31st, uh, 2021, uh, as part of the WGA's annual conference. And the subjects focused on how to get your book translated and published. So uh, we're going to continue uh, the discussion uh, by uh, inviting our panelists today. Uh, and hopefully the information will benefit uh, uh, members of both uh, communities. So I'm going to drop some links uh, uh, to help people uh, get an idea of uh, you know, the things that I mentioned. Okay, back to you, Luciana. Thank you so much, Lele. So here is a little bit about the 101 series um, that we are uh, co-hosting here with Lele. The 101 series is part of the Horizons Writers Circle uh, and the Edmonton Arts Council funding. And uh, it's a series that aspires to introduce emerging writers to the different aspects of the literary ecosystem um, of Canada. Uh, the first installment was done on literary festivals, and this is our second uh, session as well. So I'm really glad that we are coinciding with Lele to run this event for you all. <clears throat> so um, I would like to, first of all, introduce our panelists. We will have a first a Ariana Danino. Dr. Danino is a writer, literary translator, and academic researcher. She was born in Genoa, Italy and studied in London, Moscow, and Boston before entering international reporting. 
Um, after earning a PhD in comparative literature at the University of South Australia, she was awarded a SHERC postdoctoral fellowship to do research on bilingual writing and self-translation at the University of Ottawa, the School of Translation. She currently teaches Italian studies at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Ariana has translated and published books, both in Italian and English, of fiction and creative nonfiction. She self-translated into English her post-apartheid novel, The Afrikaner, Guernica Editions, Toronto, and the creative nonfiction Il Quintetto di Istanbul, The Istanbul Quintet, an ensemble, Rome. Um, we also have uh, Stephen Hendren, uh, the author of six novels, most recently, The World, of, uh, the World of After by Cormorant Books in 2021. Uh, since 2007, he has been the general editor of the Biblio Oasis International Translation Series. Hennigan has translated novels into English from Portuguese, Romanian, and Spanish. As a translator, he has been long listed twice for the Best Translated Book Award and once for the International Dub Dublin Literary Award. Stephen Hennigan holds a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Oxford and is professor head of Spanish and Hispanic studies at the School of Languages and Literatures at Guelph University and specializes in 20th and 21st century Spanish American fiction and Lusophone African literature. And we have also uh, Yasser Abdelatif, a writer, poet and translator from Cairo, Egypt. He has lived and worked in Edmonton since 2010. He has published four fiction books, three poetry collections, and translated many literary works from French and English into Arabic, amongst them a volume of letters of Van Gogh. He writes mainly in Arabic, although his works have been translated into English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. He has participated in literary events and festivals in France, Spain, Colombia, Germany, the Netherlands, Malta, United Arab Emirates, and Korea. Abdul Latif was a resident of the International Writing Program at the University of I Iowa in 2009. Mm. His debut novel, Law of Inheritance, won the Sawiris Prize in 2005 in the Young Writers category. His collection of short stories, Jonah in the Belly of the Whale, won the same prize in the category of prominent writers in 2011. So I'm going to get started finally <laughs> with the panel itself. Thank you. Um, what sorry. I wanted to ask you, sorry, yes. Any questions before we start? All good? Okay. So I would like to begin our panel um, by asking you all here to provide a quick approximation of what literary translation entails for you personally, and which has been your most rewarding experience of literary translation. Who would like to begin? <laughs> what is the second part of your question, Luciana, please, again? The first one, um, first one is, what do you think is your own working definition of literary translation mm -hmm. uh, for you, the, what it means second. personally? And the second is, which has been your most rewarding experience of literary translation so far? Perhaps I can start uh, uh, answering the first question and then I leave the, and then I can, yeah, and then we can take turns. <laughs> yes. That sounds great. I'll take it from here, guys. Okay. Yeah. So. Let's say that in general terms, literary translation refers to the translation of literary texts, whether we talk about prose fiction, drama, or poetry, whether we talk about popular fiction, uh, books written in, specific, in a specific genre, fantasy, science fiction, memoirs, uh, thrillers, or highbrow works of literature. So literary texts typically aim to provoke emotions and entertain rather than influence or inform. They are judged as fictional, uh, whether they are fact-based or not. They may demand extra reading effort by audiences. And in addition, their meanings may be ambiguous or indeterminable. So having said that, they may use poetic language that privileges language form. And so that I think is a main uh, thing for us as literary translators, the fact that 
we need to be, to really keep in mind uh, how to be able to replicate the language form together with all the rest in uh, in our translations. So yes, obviously not a, a single text can uh, you know display all the features that I have been talking about, but the language form is there and needs to be taken uh, in a, into account. Thank you, Ariana. That's very illuminating, especially for those of us who are not that familiar with the intricacies uh, and subtleties of it. Of it. So um, who would like to go next? Well, I will, I will speak about my experience as a literary translator. Sounds great. Yeah. yeah take it away. Uh, uh, let, translation for me now, it become like, my my profession. I wasn't uh, a full time literary translator until I came here in Canada, uh, 2010. Before I used to be a journalist back in Cairo. I work as a journalist uh, long long time, and when I came here, it was difficult for me to get it through the world of press and journalism as an immigrant, as in my, my whole experience is in Arabic, but I used to, I uh, start working as a translator since I was in the university, in the second year in the university, I was training myself and I was kind of specialized in children books, kids books and uh, young adults. And I work with a, a publisher, a small publisher specialized in uh, young adults. And I've, I've done many uh, Canadian, French Canadian stuff. Uh, and then when I came he here, uh, I had to involve myself in the, in because I, no other thing to, to gain money except for this. And this, you can do it from anywhere. And I have still have my connections with the publishers back in Egypt and the other, in other Arabic countries. Now so I'll continue working with the young adults, uh, but my first uh, step toward the adult works uh, was uh, by uh, translating the famous book by Charles Perrou, uh, Le Comte de Ma Mère Loi, which is uh, my mother, uh, Mother Goose Tales. Mm -hmm. uh, it's supposedly it's a young adult books, but it's not because it's a very old uh, 27th, uh, 17th century language French. So, and uh, now, now their kids won't read it, I think. And they know all the stories from the cartoons and stuff. So they won't read Cinderella as, as mm -hmm. uh, Peru. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and from there, and I was working with with a with a professor in translation who works in uh, Université de Paris, mm -hmm. uh, a very good guy, and he guided me mm -hmm. how to because I I, I have studied translation and I, I've, been, I've, uh, I've done uh, philosophy in the university, so I was not specialized. I trained myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second step, he he throw me directly to Emil Zola, which is very a very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the shift from like Peru and the uh, fairy tales to to Emil Zola, like was uh, a very Baptism big challenge, by fire. Very, <laughs> very big challenge, yeah. And I did, uh, accomplished. And then it continued. And then like in those 10 years, I've done like seven books or something. And among them, the very big volume of the essential letters of uh, Vincent van Gogh. And I've done this from English because uh, there was no Dutch translator. And also like 20% uh, of, the, of the letters were in French. The last mm. two years uh, letters were in French. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've done the French letters from French and I've done the Dutch letters from English. Mm -hmm. so and it took me three years working on this volume. 
Wow, very time consuming, that's for yeah. sure. Yes, but you're done with that, right? Hopefully you're finished with the, that work. Yeah, and this is beside my work as a writer. And also I think it's it's a very uh, challenging challenging thing uh, to deal with, with the language of another writer. Mm, and it's like, and it's, uh, enrich your, your, your own language, your mother language, mother tongue by when you, Try to find the right, as uh, Ariana said, when we try to find the right expression or the, the tone of the foreign writers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it trained you in your, in your, in your language. Yes. When, you, when you go back to your own work, to your writing, you find yourself more ready or mm -hmm. more, yeah, thank you. I think no that Yassel really, Yassel really exemplifies what I was trying to say that, I mean, you really, as a literary translator, it would be better if you were also a, a writer yourself, because you need to have the writing skills of a writer to a certain extent, that you need to be able to replicate the nuances, yeah. the ambiguities and the style of the work you are translating. That's excellent. And that's a perfect bridge into Stephen, because of course, Stephen, you're a novelist, you're a translator, and you've translated also uh, from Latin American authors or yeah. Hispanic yes. authors. Yes. So yes, yeah, yes. if you want to talk about that experience or anything else, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, well, first, it's very nice to see you all. And I see a couple of people in the audience whom I know also. And of course, it's nice to be in it's always a pleasure to be in Edmonton in January, especially, <laughs> espe especially virtually. <laughs> what a joy. Better than Toronto <laughs> with the snow. <laughs> Two years ago, I was in Edmonton in February. I did a reading in Edmonton in February 2019. So that oh, was a, an interesting... Where are you now, Stephen? I'm in Guelph, Ontario, just outside Toronto. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway. The, um, the, anyway, yeah. For me, I, I kind of, tra translation was something that was always sort of hovering just over my head. It was always seemed like something that I should do, but I didn't really know how to do it mm -hmm. uh, because I, you know, I wrote a lot and then I, but I also spent a lot of time studying languages um, mm -hmm. and I had done a few short things, mainly from Spanish, a little bit from French and the, the, I think think though that I mean what you really have the most important thing for me is that it is part of your overall literary experience and literary vocation I actually there's a very strong movement now that I see particularly among younger translators to just be translators and you see a lot of this emerging yeah. in things like the campaign to get translators royalties on the novels they translate. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I think about that. And it's not something I really want to wade into, but I think it's indicative of the fact that people are starting to want to see it as an exclusive profession. And personally, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. I think the, I think you have to, you translate because you are engaged with language already. And it's another way of being engaged with language. And it's a, it's something that you do. I, I don't think actually you're as good a translator if you're just a translator. Mm -hmm. I think you're a better translator if you are also a short story writer or a novelist or even an academic writer, frankly. I, I mean, I know a couple of very good translators who started off writing academic books, not jargon filled academic books, fairly accessible academic books, but even so, that um, that I think is is really essential. Um, I totally most... agree, Stephen. If I can just jump in yeah, and go say ahead, please. this, because yes, you are you are, you not you not only need to be engaged with the language, but also with reading and analyzing literary texts. You really need to be passionate about the, about that. Um, otherwise, I mean, otherwise you are not complete. I mean, in, in your, your in your professional back, uh, background, the, in the professional background that is needed, that is required to become a literary translator. Mm -hmm. Yes, I teach in a in a language department, and in Spanish we well we have one translation course, and I don't even know what goes on there. I'm not involved in it, but there are a lot of. French to English, English to French translation courses in our department. 
And students are always coming to me and saying, do you use this technique when you have this verb tense to this verb tense? Well, and I, my answer is always, well, it depends. Um, <laughs> because you've got to have a feel for that particular situation. And so I think ultimately, it may even be a mistake to try and teach translation in that sort of mechanistic way, because I don't think it serves the either text very well. And it, it, it risks locking you into certain fixed procedures, which then produce a, a, a kind of awkward result. There's a famous case in Spanish where um, there was a man named Alfred McAdam who for a few years in the 1980s became a very popular translator among the writers of the Latin American boom. So he translated a, two or three novels by Carlos Fuentes and one or two by, by um, Garcia Marquez. And at one point he started to use um, the, he started to translate because he was very, he was very systematic. He would always translate the same word in the same way. And there's a, a famous case with uh, Garcia Marquez where there's this kind of incomprehensible uh, Colombian word, baina. And only Colombians really know what baina means because it can mean something different in every situation. It means and everything start, and anything. He, yeah. Said, yeah. And the, I was once in, the, in a meeting, in a political meeting with a, a group of Colombians where after about three hours, one Colombian said to the other, pero compañero. Esta vaina es una vaina vainísima. And so, um, the, yeah. and vaina like, so, vaina like cosa here. Like, yeah, yeah, same. yeah, cosa in, in Italian, yeah. Or the, but the, but this gentleman began translating vaina the same way every time it appeared. And there was a lot of criticism of the translation, not always by people who knew the original, but it was clear that it was awkward because of that. And so I think that's maybe part of the argument against a more mechanistic approach, shall we say. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I totally agree because uh, to a certain extent, it's like you needed to go on the same creative journey made by the author himself or herself. So, and you need to recreate in your mind the same thing that all the different characters, the different voices, the different inflections, uh, yeah. all the different situations that those characters uh, find themselves in. And so it's a, you, you can't you know, just be, I mean, as you are saying, Stephen, be so mechanistic in the way you translate. Okay. You need to be very creative and recreate that whole word, that whole fictional word. And that includes a knowledge of the context. And I'll give you an example of that. I, I think these things are always best expressed through examples because it's Again, it's very difficult to generalize about translation. It's always a matter of specifics. Um, but I translated the novel Os Transparentes by the Angolan writer Onjaki, and I translated it as a Transparent City. Um, and we were fortunate enough that the original translation, which was published by Biblioasis, uh, was picked up by a British company, which has now brought out a British edition of the novel. But they decided that before they brought out the British edition, they would have somebody do an edit to Britishize the language. Mm -hmm. um, now I try. I'm. I, you know, spent a lot of. I've spent about twelve years of my life in in Great Britain. My translation register is somewhat mid-Atlantic anyway. But they hired a Brazilian living in the United States who had never been to England to translate my translation into British English. And the now here's where an, a lack of understanding of the culture comes in, because Angola is a country that came to independence through, in 1975 through a Marxist-Leninist independence movement, which means that a lot of the everyday vocabulary comes out of Marxism-Leninism. And even today, uh, Angolans will sometimes call each other comrade on the street even though it's no longer a, a communist society. And in the novel, people were often calling each other comrade. Um, the Brazilian living in the United States who was translating it into British English changed every single instance of comrade in the novel to mate. 
Mate. thinking that this was what British people said at the pub. Now, of course, there's a total tone deafness there to different levels of English diction because uh, an upper class English person mm -hmm. would never say mate. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the idea that you could replace comrade with mate effectively eliminates Angolan history, which involves the, the fact that independence came through the language of Marxism-Leninism. He wanted um, to avoid the footnotes. Well, there weren't, there, there weren't footnotes. We did have a glossary, but there weren't footnotes. Mm. I mean, I insisted on it all being taken out. I, made, I, I had to make something like 1,500 changes to the editing job that was done by this Brazilian from Missouri uh, who purported to put the book into English. And the other thing I noticed was that she'd actually eliminated almost every reference to Angolan history because she wanted it to sound like a Brazilian novel. Her idea mm. of something written in Portuguese was that it should be a Brazilian novel. So, it, she, so anything that referred to Angolan history interfered with that and it got What's taken out. So, you know, so the, the cultural context is absolutely essential to mm -hmm. the translation. Mm -hmm. and, and also- Eliminate yes. that. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have this um, favorite paragraph of Teju Cole. Uh, that he says, translation after all, and that sums up the conversation we've been having here. Translation after all is literary analysis mixed with sympathy, a matter of the brain as well as the heart. Um, for some reason, that somehow resonates with me, perhaps not with you all, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with Petra that. Petra Cole has never done any translating, that's what bothers me no, about that No, he was talking statement. about his German translator. And, oh, I see. Uh, which okay. brings yeah. me, which brings me, which brings me to the next question, which is, um, could you tell us anything about uh, how to have a productive relationship between writer, translator, and editor? Who wants to jump in? Oh boy! <laughs> 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 um, From your Lele viewpoint, should, I think Lele should tell us about her editor in Chi the editor in China who published Perfect. her translation. Perfect. <laughs> Lele, your time to shine. Uh, you know, my plan is to be uh, kind of fly on the wall, <laughs> you know, listen to uh -uh. <laughs> uh, um, Well, um, I, I'm thinking, yeah, so I actually, uh, talking about the editorial experience of, you know, me translating nationalism, you know, it's a nonfiction book, right? Right. Um, and the book was kind of uh, delayed because of uh, the kind of political references in the book. Uh, there is an example mentioning, you know, uh, Japanese uh, kind of military uh, militarism uh, in, in the book as an example of nationalism. It's a negative example of nationalism. So which kind of offended the sensibility of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I guess Chinese readers that yeah. in the editor's head, right? And so uh, for some reason, you know, the, the translated version was delayed because of this uh, whole political uh, uh, process of censoring and, you know, uh, monitoring uh, the properness or appropriateness, uh, appropriateness of, you know, the text. And that's something that came to my mind when listening to, to the question. Uh, other than that, um, I think the editor is quite uh, trustable, um, and I was lucky. It's actually my first, uh, you know, trans translation project from English to Mandarin. Um, so I was lucky in that sense. But you know, I, I wrote an article on which is uh, which was published in uh, Westward, uh, which is a magazine of uh, W. GA's uh, kind of magazine. Uh, I talk about translation is art, which connects to what Ariana said, you know, the, the whole, and also Stephen uh, talked about this just now, uh, how the translation process is creative, right, rather than uh, um, mechanistic, uh, and, and how, do, how do you need to be uh, equipped with cultural sensibilities on both sides in order to bridge um, the linguistic and cultural gap and in, in order to produce uh, the translated version. 
Yeah. Yeah. Laila, yeah. you touched upon a, a word, you, you um, trust. And I think <laughs> that in, in this triangle between the editor, the, the translator and the author, uh, trust is a, a key word. Uh, and, it, and, and, and together with uh, re, uh, respect and open-mindedness or flexibility, or whatever you want to call it, it can become a powerful triangle. So the, because there are three different uh, professional figures and all of them with their own specific competencies. So they need, but these three figures need to be able to trust each other, uh, each other's competencies and professionalism. And what I mean with open mind and flexibility, you need to, to be able to uh, be open to accept suggestions, changes, revisions. And sometimes it happened to me, you know, um, I would resent or get annoyed to, you know, certain comments uh, or the idea of, you know, having to rework a, a, a particular sentence or a particular paragraph. But uh, if you just leave it there and uh, you, know, you, you, you let it simmer, you think about it a few days, you just keep, and then you get, go back to the text and uh, you rework it. And then you realize that sometimes those comments, those suggestions needed to be there, needed to be made, and you needed to rework that particular sentence that particular passage. That's great. Yes. I have two. I have two points in this. Uh, first thing, I, I would like to comment on Stephen' statement about translator who are only translator. Uh, on the practical level, this is not uh, useful. You won't get enough money unless you work like like crazy to translate yeah, yeah. a book by month and. And the result is going to be horrible. You have very bad translation. You have, you have very bad translation. So we do the translation as writers as a subsidy to our income because we don't get a lot of money from our writing. So the literary translator is like a, a side uh, income for us. When you want to be like a literary translator, you're going to work like donkey. You're going to work like... <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Yeah, uh, most of the good translators are, are like Stephen said, like they're academic or writers or journalists. Or, mm -hmm. They are in the field somehow and they love to do it and they have mm -hmm. some more money from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but to rely on the translation, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing uh, in that this triangular relation between the the translator, the editor, and the publisher, and then sometimes the, the foreign writer, mm -hmm. four yeah. parts in the... Uh, it's very complicated sometimes because the, yeah. to approach uh, the publisher, there's two ways. You can have your suggestion of, book, of a book and you go to the publisher. He said, well, look, I have this book uh, and I, I would love to translate it. It's a very good book. He can accept or not. And the other way is he commissioned you as a translator to translate uh, the, a book he, cho he has chosen. Uh, a lot of amateur translators, they do the first, mis the first approach, which is sometimes a mistake because nobody wants to take this book, even though it's a very good book. Uh, the other thing is, what is the, the language, the original language and the, the source language and the, the target language? For, for example, if you're translating from French to Arabic, it's not the same when you're translating from Arabic to French. The relations of power between the, the languages, it's, uh, it's very political. Mm -hmm. Though I would say that the Arabic language is bigger than the French language from the, the, the speakers. You have the, the, like the, but still the, 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 the relations 
are there, the relations of the old uh, colonial powers, and then the nowadays liberal uh, democratic uh, powers. And the third one, though, could be the Arabic, a, big lang a bigger language than the French. Mm -hmm. And we can see this between all the all the languages, the the, the game power of imbalances, mm -hmm. game of power. Sometimes mm -hmm. the uh, translator. I will take. I will talk like as a writer now. I'm I'm lucky because my English translator, the guy who translates my work into English, is a very flexible guy, and he's he's not. He doesn't have this old mentality of the Arabist or the Orientalist. And he is also, he doesn't do this, uh, you know, this editing to be very British. He's a British guy, but he doesn't do the, this, uh, this tricks. And he, he follows my, my, my tone. Mm. Uh, but I had once another relation with a German translator. He was a scholar, a very traditional Arabist, like the, the classical Orientalist. And it started with even with my name. Uh, he said that in, in German, we don't have the Y or the W, uh, the Y. Why? So your name would start with a J. I said, no, <laughs> my name is like a C. J as in Jägermeister? <laughs> yeah. it, it could be in Spanish too. Huh? Yeah. And he said, uh, no, we can't. I said my name is a C, like a C, like a. Uh, uh, I can't change the the letters in Latin to a J. This is another name in Arabic because there's Jasser in Arabic and there's Yasser, then two very two different two different names. But he insisted, and he played the the game of power on me as a as a writer from the third world, and uh, he is the the white orientalist guy who gonna present me to the german re readers mm -hmm. so that i uh, i love how the different experiences are coming here because like in in, in Lele's case as a translator writer translator uh, yes sir as a writer when you get your work translated you live in the first world the Translator is from the first world. In Ariana's case, also it's interesting because you're a self-translator, right? Like you're yes. so so. Uh, I'll get to you, Stephen, in a minute. But I was very intrigued by by Ariana's. How do you do? You are the writer and you are the translator. How even did you, yes, did you so negotiate that? Thank you for this question because it also I, I can also answer the the, the, the initial question. So when you said what was the most rewarding <laughs> <translation laughs> there you go <laughs> project? Yes, in my case, yes. I, for example, I really enjoy translating into Italian a French novel set in Cameroon. Um, it was called uh, Passion, uh, Ma Passion Africaine by Nike Nietzsche Bergeret, um, and. So, uh, because it allowed me to uh, discover another culture, a totally new culture at a deep level. However, my most fulfilling experience was self-translating my own novel. Um, it's a post-apartheid novel set in South Africa because I was there uh, working as an international reporter in South Africa during the passage, you know, that, that transitional moment from, you know, after the, the fall of the apartheid regime and uh, the new black uh, mm -hmm. elected uh, government. Mm -hmm. So that, that novel is inspired by those years there. And I had initially written it in Italian and published it in Italian, and then I self-translated it into English. And in this case, um, I was free to act, yes, fully, both as a translator and as a creative writer, because uh, it allowed me to, you know, to rework my text and uh, to adapt it to an English audience, an English speaking audience, but also to, for example, uh, once you, you read your text again, you translate it, you want to change it more. And so I, I went into full creative mode, a creative writing mode again. And so I took the liberty of changing uh, several passages, changing some of the dialogues, 
deleting things, adding other passages. And in all this, I think the most fruitful thing uh, and uh, rewarding thing was the fact that I was able also to work collaboratively in, thanks to a group of friends and uh, also professionals, uh, mother tongue, English mother tongue, who were willing you know, to uh, go through the text and provide their own feedback. And so it was a very uh, fruitful experience, absolutely. So I haven't to speak about, about my rewarding experience, uh, Lucia. <laughs> but maybe we can listen to, to Stephen first. I'm really dying yeah. to hear because Stephen mm -hmm. is also a publisher. So in that equation, oh, well, we yeah, have, yeah. you know, translators, Lele and Ariana, mm -hmm. Yasser, the author, and you're the publisher. Can you tell us how know, okay. you work? <laughs> I, one, one, one correction, I'm not a publisher. Oh, um, sorry about that. The publisher of Biblioasis is Dan Wells. I'm, oh, okay. I am general editor of the translation series. Oh, there you go. Okay. That doesn't mean I have total power, though. It means that I can suggest things, and I do a lot of the editing. And, I see. And I, I get some of the things I want to get through, and other things don't get through. And sometimes other things get put in that I didn't choose, some of which I end up liking a lot. Um, but it's, uh, so my position is a bit more ambiguous, but the, Good. yes, I've about like uh, Yasser, I've had uh, problems with the Germans. Um, the, uh, I, uh, a short book of mine, a short nonfiction book of mine was translated into German and I had made reference to undocumented immigrants. And this came out illegal immigrants when they gave me the the German, they gave me a, the, the draft of the German translation. I read it through and I said, wait a minute, I didn't want it to say illegal immigrants. I don't believe in that concept. I, I, I wanted to say immigrants without documents. And the, and I was told by the translator, no, 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 in German, we don't have that idea. In German, immigrants are illegal. <laughs> no, <but> in Europe, <laughs> and so, Europe, they don't have this um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so those kinds of things can come through too, and you, you are going to end up having a hard time fighting against them. I, I find mm -hmm. um, the so that's yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, what am I supposed to be answering now? Sorry. Well, no. How was the equation? <laughs> um, Writer, translator, editor. I think yeah, you have yeah. answered um, it. Um, I've had every kind of relationship. Um, I had one of my books was translated into Romanian and I never met the, uh, the translator and never had any communication from her. Um, I, on the, uh, in the series that I work on, we work usually fairly closely with the writer, but really our primary relationship is with the translator. There are certain writers who, because we've worked with them for a very long time and or because their English is very good, have a little more um, say in how the translation is written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, um, well, it is yeah. a it's a complicated relationship though, and it's translators and writers are often. I mean, ideally, should be uh, develop a kind of loyalty to each other, um, and yet this can be very hard if we did one book by a writer. And the translator has read the new book and says it's great, and then for some reason we don't do it. Then the tra then we've got a disaffected translator. Um, so those sorts of things are always there, and there's no publisher who avoids that completely. Um, the and there are cases where people interfere. There's the famous Girls of Riyadh case, which Yasser probably knows about. Um, Sorry, the, what is it? the girls of Riyadh. You remember that? Yeah, one? yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the. Where the, it was a a twenty five year old medical the, student in Chicago yeah. wrote a novel about the experience of being a young woman in Saudi Arabia, and all of the things you have to do just to get the cell phone of a young man, like you know, looking out the window of your car, and then he flashes sort of like this to get, the, and that's his cell phone number, and you write it down, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's all about the sort of the repression of, of Saudi Arabian yeah. society in its most traditionalist form. And it was translated by one of the leading translators of Arabic, and I'm very sorry, I've forgotten her name now, but she's, she's at the University of Illinois. And they gave, this Catherine, was Penguin. I, I can't Catherine believe Booth. Penguin did this, but they gave, sorry? Catherine Booth? Yeah. 
can, I might have been, yeah. But the, is it, she's an the, anthropologist? I don't know what her other profession is, but she, um, she, she did it, the translation. Penguin then gave the proof to the author, who was a 25-year-old Saudi Arabian student in Chicago with all right English, enough English to listen to lectures in medical school, but not very good English. And she then corrected the translator's English mm. and, and produced things that were incomprehensible, literally incomprehensible, and somehow persuaded Penguin to print this. Um, I, was given, I was given the book to review. I wrote a review saying, this is a very strange book in English because parts of it are beautifully translated and then parts of it are written in, a, in an English that is like the English of someone who's been learning English for six months and, and it's incomprehensible. And so the review was published and two weeks later, there was a letter to the editor from the translator saying, it may surprise you to know that I agree with Stephen Hennigan's criticism of my translation because the penguin gave it back to the author to correct and she, she ruined the English. Um, so <laughs> there, it can take very strange forms. And I think this is an argument for recognizing that everyone has their role and that the, a lot of writers, we also live in a time when everybody thinks they speak English and a lot of writers will correct things on the basis of quite poor English. If the and that can be an issue also, um, so that's where there is a need for the the translator to be respected. I think because sometimes you do get this this if happening. I mean, I've, add, I've seen other if cases. Can add also... just a comment on what Stephen is saying from the writer's point of view? Who I mean, my my novel, The Africana, has been translated into German and into Arabic as well. Mm -hmm. And in that case, because I don't know either Arabic or German, or my German is so poor that I couldn't, uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't even be able to really check the translation, I think uh, it's good to think that once the translation is there, is out there, it's, it's another text, a totally different work. Yeah. And it, it doesn't belong to you as a writer anymore. And it, it is more, you know, the interpretation of another person of your own writing and also their own recreation of, of that fictional word in their own words. So in that sense, uh, you have to trust the translator. I mean, perhaps he is or she is a, a bad translator and, and perhaps then you will, someone else uh, will need to do another translation to, to, <laughs> to, to yeah. correct. Well, that's another thing. No, no translation is definitive. Translations do get redone if the book is relevant enough that they, they almost always get redone after about 40 years anyway the mm -hmm. the other thing is i've found that people care a lot about what their english translation is like mm -hmm. they actually don't care that much if the polish translation or the serbian translation doesn't come out that well because a very small audience is going to read that but mm -hmm many publishers and many literary agents see the English translation, in my experience, as a way to sell the book in the rest of the world. Yes. So we find that what happens with some of the books we edit is that if, it's, if the English translation is coming out at a relatively early stage of the book's career, where they're still hoping to, to uh, sell it in other countries, we will get pressure, not only from the author, but often from the literary agent and from people in, sometimes even people in the home publisher, the original publisher, to ensure that the English translation is of a high quality. Because if they're going to try to sell the book in Sweden or Japan, the Swedish or Japanese publisher probably can't read the book in the original language, but they can read it in English. Mm -hmm. So the English translation is often, the agent will often send out the English translation to publishers in other countries. Mm -hmm. if the, because those people might not read Portuguese or Romanian or Hungarian, but they, they will read English. 
So English, the lingua franca of the translation world in a way. And, and also <laughs> a way of selling, selling translations into other markets. Yes, actually. and that's where I'm going now because um, I wanted to ask you all if you know, so whoever wants to jump in first, feel free. How do you go from, I would like to buy the translation rights for this particular book of foreign literature <laughs> to the finished product? Can anyone oh do God. a little translation rights for dummies here? <laughs> It's different every time. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been involved in about in the series that I, I helped to edit. I've been involved in about 35 or 40 rights purchases. And I would have to say almost everyone has been different. Mm -hmm. um, there are cases where you go, you're dealing mainly with the author. There are cases where you're dealing with an agent who isn't very interested your cases where you're dealing with an agent who is very interested. Um, and there are many cases where it's just arranged between the two publishers. Um, there are cases where you are buying North American rights to a translation that has already been completed in the UK. And then you have to make a decision about whether you just print it as is, or whether you try to translate it into North American English which most of the time is not a good idea. Um, uh, and the, so, but that's another form of translation and it's a very Canadian form of translation. Harlequin Romance for years had its international headquarters in Montreal because they, they translated British Harlequin Romances into American English and American Harlequin Romances into British English. And they found that Canada was the best place to find people who could do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's Amazing. that, but I think the right sales, are, um, one thing that uh, happens, of course, that we find is sometimes we get a book which has, you know, been sold into Croatian and into Norwegian and into uh, Flemish, and nobody got very much money from any of those deals. And then you, you when you make an offer for English rights, some people, will, the people who've been in the business for a while are realistic and don't expect a lot of money. But if you're dealing, for example, I've known of a couple of cases uh, where people were dealing with family members of deceased famous writers or writers who are mm -hmm. famous in their own countries. And after the book has been sold for 500 euros in Croatia and 700 euros in, to, in Belgium, they, when it comes to English, they think, oh boy, we're going to get $50,000 because it's English. And you have to bring them back to earth. Um, there is, again, nobody who's been in the business for very long would, would think that, but family members often think that. <laughs> and they will, and think that, you know, this is going to be what will pay off the grandchildren's u university education or something. We'll be selling grandfather's masterpiece in English. But of course, there, if it went for 600 euros in Flemish, it'll probably go for 1,200 or 1,500 in English, and that's probably all you'll get for it. That's that's wonderful. Thank you for for, for answering <laughs> this question because um, yeah. you know those. It's it's so funny how compartmentalized everything seems. This is the the behind the scenes what we don't talk about. We just talk about the language, talk about culture yeah. and purity, well, that, and this and that. we don't talk about we don't talk about the rights and we don't talk about the politics of that or the politics of translation that we just uh, breached recently. So uh, that brings me also um, to the introduction in Canada of other literatures. So um, what is the market there? What are the possibilities or how does it work here um, of translated works in Canada? What is it, the deal there, here? Because um, in, in Latin America, it's huge. <laughs> we love consuming uh, foreign literature in translation from all over the world. I'm from Argentina, the, I know that, but. And the same well, in the, Ar the Argentines are a particular case, I think. But the nerds, <laughs> we're nerds. <laughs> well, what did Cortázar said? Los, oh, Argentinos, Cortázar. Son, los Argentinos son lectores non-stop. <laughs> there you go. And, and, and language literature. So that's what yeah. it was for him and um, for those of us who love Julio. Yeah. So there you go. Um, anyway, let's continue talking about this. Um, yeah, talk about other literatures here in Canada. Like, who would you like to see? What happens? 
you can talk about anything um, you want. Could, could I inject a, a note of realism, if not ice water, into this? Um, if it's magical, yes. Otherwise, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, it's very, very difficult to sell translated literature in English. English readers have a prejudice against translated literature. That is why English competes with Arabic to be the, the language in the world that translates the least. They're both at about 2%, 2.5% of total publications are translations, whereas in Italian, it's more like 65 or 70%. Yeah. Um, so the English is quite a closed, English speakers are quite closed in a world that consists mainly of other English speakers. Uh, they're not terribly open. There have been exceptions. There was the Garcia Marquez craze. There was the Sartre, Beauvoir, Albert Camus craze in the 1950s. And Bolaños, so on. There, no? Bolaños, what? no? Bolaños, Bolaño, no? Yeah, Bolaño sort of got the second wave or the third More wave. More for the academics. Of, of the people say. who, you know, for the academics, you've got all the French Bolaño in French America, theorists. only not in England. Huh? What? Bolaño in America, not in England. Really? Um, the fashion of Bolaño. Started, started out in England, though, the translations. Really? The first translations were done, well, the first translations of Bolaño, little known fact, were done in Melbourne, the first oh. translations into English, in oh, Melbourne, Australia. But the wow. Australian public translator then succeeded in publishing them in England. And it was actually papers like the TLS and the Guardian that first discovered him in English. Yeah. Um, but yeah, eventually he became more popular in, in the US. The, we, I, I have to say, I mean, Canada, the biggest translation traffic in Canada is, the, of course, the government-sponsored translation of French Canadian books into English and English Canadian books into French. Yeah. And those are subsidized. You can't lose money, really, because there are enough subsidies. Um, but very few of them have become widely read. Even authors, um, I've been thinking a lot about Marie-Claire Blais recently, because she, she just died and she's somebody who had a big impact on me when I was in my teens. But even her books never really caught on with one or two semi exceptions. Um, the, I, I think if I can jump in here, yeah, sure. even just to say that sometimes it's also a problem of marketing because because of the, of the fact that these translations are subsidized, then the publishers are happy by just yes. publishing them, but then they don't make the extra step of marketing the book in the, also you know, the, the market. No, you're absolutely right. Sorry, That's true. Ariana. Sorry, Ariana. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Also, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> the market is very narrow in Canada. Yeah, it's not yeah. like in, it's not like in uh, America. So that's I, also I would say the market there is narrow too, actually. But I mean, the the issue I think is more the is more English language culture. Uh, I'll give you one example. There, it has been demonstrated that if you put the translator's name on the cover, which is a common request now of translators' organizations that the translator's name go on the cover. If you do that, you reduce sales significantly mm -hmm. because English language people don't like to pick up a book that has that they announces on the cover that it's a translation. We still do it. We put we always put on the cover translated from the whatever by whoever. Um, however, I have to say we we started out the Biblioasis International Translation Series in 2007 with the idea of, of doing international literature in Canada. The idea being that international translations into English should not just be done in New York and London, but we should be able to do them here. Um, that's not entirely still the focus of the series, although it remains one of my goals. The, but the, the, what we have found is that effectively about 80 to 90% of our sales are in the States. Then how do we uh, justify the success, let's say, of Charcoal Press, for instance, which is also big here and all over the world? Is that true or is that marketing? Um, they have, uh, I did, they were very successful in the UK. And when they decided, I actually had coffee with, uh, with Carolina in Edinburgh, just as she was about to launch into the States. And I thought there were some serious obstacles 
to getting her books into the States. Mm -hmm. And she's had, they've only been doing it for two years, but they've yeah, actually had much, more, they, they've had much more luck than I would expect. Yeah. And um, I think they've, they've had a few books that were quite out there, quite daring and unexpected and even a bit shocking. Mm -hmm. And I think that has helped. Mm -hmm. um, the, okay. um, but the, but we have, I mean, we now depend largely on a large network of independent bookstores in college towns, as they call them in the States and, and larger, larger cities. Mm -hmm. um, we find that unfortunately, although our goal was to endow Canada with the gift of international translations, Canada really wasn't very enthusiastic about receiving that gift. Um, so, but it's wonderful um, that you so got the ball no, rolling. <laughs> yeah, there are there are still a few. I mean, and we, weirdly, even a couple of the Quebec translations, because we started doing Quebec translations, mm -hmm. um, even a couple of the Quebec translations that have sold well, have sold well in the states. There's one called Le Plongeur, the the dishwasher which is a kind of rough, tough novel about a guy getting a job as an all night dishwasher in a restaurant in Montreal. And he gets mixed up with organized crime and stuff. Um, and it, we've sold thousands of copies in the States, but not that many in, in Canada. Well, in French? In, oh. From French, French yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the English version. The English, the English version. version. I would yeah. love to read it. I'm buying it. Thank you for the rest. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> okay. So um, I have, a, I think it's time, unless anyone needs to add something else, but I would like to maybe open the floor for questions. Sure. I think it's just about time and we will have about, you know, 15, 20 minutes of questions from the public. So um, I know that Edward Van Vliet had a question. <laughs> um, he said, I came late to the discussion so you may have addressed this. Are there differences in reception of translations based on genre, uh, for instance, poetry collections? I don't know if anybody wants to, um, yeah, to expand on that. I can, the, the, I can go speak ahead. Of, yeah, uh, go for it. Translating poetry and publishing translated poetry, it's a very difficult uh, process. Big uh publishers they don't want to publish poetry uh, books and especially uh, translated poetry book unless it's like uh Baudelaire or some the big name the very big names mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the 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 path of poetry to the publishers are really narrow and uh, difficult mm -hmm. you have this uh, invention like chat books and the small publishers that, that produces uh, poetry books and they sell them in the universities and but the production in the poet on the poetry level it's very feeble I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um thank you yes sir for your answer um i just have um another question um the titles that look fairly literary, does that play a factor in uh, in selling as opposed to genre fiction in translation? Is there a comparison or is there a market or is there a production of genre fiction in translation? I'm asking out of ignorance that here someone, Laurie Strauss posed the question. I mean, sure, there, there have been periods where certain types of genre fiction from certain cultures became popular. I mean, I think the, the lead example would be Scandinavian murder mysteries. Right. Um, but, and obviously it's, I think it's easier to get books translated probably if they're genre fiction, but often the, tra the fact that they are translations is concealed again or, mm -hmm. or obscured by the publisher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it is, of its nature or rather literary thing. So it tends to be strongest uh, in the literary press world, I would say. If I can add something here, um, sometimes it's also a question of 
cultural interests in a particular um, cultural area. For example, with Italy, we have had this big success of the translation into English of Elena Ferrante's uh, quadrilogy of yeah. novels. Absolutely. And, and so that's, I think it's not really related much to a particular genre because it's very also difficult to define those novels uh, or to categorize them in, within a particular uh, genre. But it's a question of, you know, particular interest as for example, with the Scandinavian novels, perhaps people were really interested in that part of the world and then to understand how people there think, act, behave. And the same is with uh, this particular Italian author. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, from China, Leila, many books would uh, would be. I mean, uh, we are waiting for big novels coming from China. You know, big fiction coming from China. There, there is such a diversity and, uh, and complexity that uh, we are really waiting for that. Yes, I would love to hear from Leila as to. Which authors are, and can you talk to us about the literary scene in China a little bit? Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, like Ariana said, it's really complicated. It's very diverse um, and uh, it's really hard to ca categorize. So uh, regionally speaking, you know, uh, I normally look at mainland China, for example, as, as a big category and uh, Taiwanese literature, uh, another category, or uh, you know, overseas Chinese uh, literature, uh, another uh, category. So um, yeah, it's really, really hard to kind of um, uh, to categorize. Um, uh, and it's hard to, 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 to choose as well. Um, and so talking, I'm thinking about the current project I'm doing is, you know, I've been working on a poetry translation, uh, which is um, the, the poetry are, were um, um, a recreation of the six Dalai Lama's, uh, you know, love poems written by contemporary poets. Uh, so, um, um, yeah, so I, I don't know, like it's it's hard because as a translator, you know, I need to think about a lot of things like, you know, I'm doing the translation work, uh, but I'm also thinking about, you know, which publisher I'll contact and um, um, and who will be publishing this, this, you know, 70 poems and um, and how they're going to, uh, you know, take care of the trans translation copyrights. So I don't know, I'm still learning in the process of, you know, working through the project. Um, uh, and novels, I'm doing short ones right now, like short pieces. Um, uh, but again, you know, I, I, I'm still kind of fumbling my way through uh, the whole thing and it's, it's time consuming, uh, very complicated, um, issues uh, to consider along the way and um, yeah mm -hmm. it's pretty tough and the other thing has to do with funding right so mm -hmm. who will fund the translation and I'm thinking of Canada Council for the Arts for example they only funded um, translation from within Canada right so that's a strictly limit um, um, a translator's uh, choice. If you, you know, if you want to be funded, you have to translate a Canadian, uh, a Chinese Canadian uh, mm -hmm. writer. Yeah, yeah. So, Can I come in here on the on the funding? I think Lele's touched on a really important point. Thank you. Another, yes, thanks. An, a, another factor which influences who we read in English is how much funding there is for writers from that particular country. If you want to translate a writer from El Salvador, you're not going to get any funding. If you want to translate a writer from Sweden, you'll get more funding than you can use. Um, and so that, that predetermines to a certain extent which country's literatures get translated into English. We've been very fortunate in the Biblioasis International Translation Series in that one of one thing we've ended up doing, it wasn't really a stated goal at the outset, but it's ended up that way, uh, is introducing the English speaking world to the literature of Lusophone Africa, the five countries in Africa that speak Portuguese. And we're very lucky 
that Portugal, which is a country that is probably marginally less prosperous than Canada and only has a population of 11 and a half million people, will fund yes. translation from any Portuguese speaking country in Africa or Timor Leste in Asia. Same with Argentina uh, so, and the program called Sur. It's the yeah, same no, thing. Yeah, no, I've used the Argentine program. What's remarkable about the Portuguese is that they mm -hmm. will fund translations from other countries, not from Portugal. Oh. From, from the, that's what I said, from the five Super, countries, yeah. the five yeah. Portuguese speaking countries in Africa. Without that, we couldn't have done what we've done. Mm. I mean, the, the, the writers we've brought into English from, from Mozambique and from Angola. And Fabulous. so so that's actually a key factor. And within Latin America, Yes, Argentina will provide funding. Brazil was providing funding until Bolsonaro came along. Mexico, in theory, provides funding, but the bureaucracy is so corrupt, you'll never get it. Mm -hmm. um, and so any, we, there was a Colombian white writer we were trying to translate for years, and we never got enough funding to do it. Korea has also. Korea right, does, Yasser? yeah. Yeah, no, Korea is good. Uh, Talking yeah. to Yasser once he told yeah. me. There is a question in the chat. Yes, exactly. Yes, thanks, Ariana. I was trying to bridge that too. So uh, here is Sophia asking Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for this compelling chat. I have but one comment realization. The more I study translation from an academic perspective, and the more I write myself and translate, the more I believe that there exists a big gap between professional literary translators and translation scholars. Mm -hmm. Many times it truly feels it's two different worlds. Any tips on how to not being stuck in the academic bubble to bridge that gap? <laughs> Thank uh, you, Sophia. You know, I want to speak uh, from my uh, experience. Yeah, I, you know, I had an academic background. So I studied uh, literary translation, translation studies. So I started from there. And what I learned um, at the beginning is the, you know, what is ethical translation, right? You have to be loyal to the original. <laughs> But then my understanding of loyalty changes, right, along the way. And if the more you translate practically, uh, the, 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 the firmer you, you, your belief becomes, you know, you need to be creative in order to, uh, you know, uh, produce a, an appealing translated version of the original. And loyalty for me at this stage is to be loyal to the spirit and the soul of the original, which means you need to betray uh, at some level the linguistic structures of, of the original. So this is, so my understanding of loyalties or ethical translations at the academic level changes, uh, you know, as I do uh, uh, translation more and more. So that's my kind of two um, And things. Sophia really touches upon a very big issue because um, academic translators, or, or actually scholars of translation uh, within the academy, tend to theorize a lot, but then not to be on the field or in the field, you know, and do the translation work. And, and so they, they don't have that kind of practical experience that uh, um, that should be taken into account you know it's easy to theorize things uh, but it's a different thing once you are in the field and you need to provide that particular for particular translation and yes i i believe there is uh, uh, there is this gap there there is a big gap uh, between the two worlds and the only way i mean you can because the, the last part of the question of sophia's question is how do I uh, succeed in not being stuck in the bubble? Yes, and to be out there, to be out in the world, and and do your mm -hmm. translation work uh, on a, a at a on a practical level. Uh, and so there are several ways of doing that, and which initially, unfortunately, imply uh, translating for free. You know, being a volunteer and uh, and getting yourself. Uh, you know, getting your name known out there, networking. And so I, I don't know if you want to add something that before I, I can provide some other practical. <laughs> Submitting to magazines, is that a good option? I don't know. Yes, of I course, yeah. yeah. I just got a poem I translated from an Argentinian poet and I'm not a professional translator, published in Agni magazine, which is, I don't know, just, 
<laughs> that theory magazine, like, yeah, not uh, far away from the academic magazines, yeah, to be present in such uh, context is good to, mm -hmm. to get out of the bubble. Huh? I guess. Anyway. Yeah. Yes, you're starting with, I think Sophia is familiar with magazine. Uh, we should start from here. Everybody start from here as a writer or as a translator. Yeah, I I can send in the in the chat a link for Sophia uh, about um, a link to Specimen, which is a review of translation connected with Babel or Bubble Translation Festival in Bellinzona in Switzerland. And it's a, a multilingual translation uh, platform. So mm -hmm. that there you can, you, you can submit your own translation in any kind of uh, language combination. And if it's accepted, uh, you can print, uh, it will be, you know, um, published digitally. And, uh, and so this is an, a way to, in, to start uh, uh, being exposed to, to the word of translation, yes. Um, I also want to mention there's yes. a translation, uh, it's a journal that contains both um, translation studies articles and, you know, uh, translation uh, work. It's called Transcultural, uh, uh, a journal of um, uh, translation and cultural studies. So uh, I think that journal uh, impresses me as a bridge between two worlds. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Agni is out of Boston University. So it's also a university connected magazine if, if Sophia is interested. Um, there is another question. I don't know, Stephen, if you wanted to say something, but there is also another question by Eva Kolash. Uh, do you have to have a permission to translate someone's work? Okay. Um, Briefly on the previous question. Yes, thanks. It, it comes back to the issue of theory versus practice. And I agree with Ariana that basically a lot of what's taught in translation courses is too unwieldy and, and cumbersome to really work that well. And you hone your skills better by reading lots of novels and reading lots of poetry. But um, yes, you do need permission or, or you need permission before you try to publish it. Um, if you're just starting out, one thing you can do, and a number of people have done this and got away with it, um, is translate part of somebody's book that you know has not been translated and then send them the translation. They may not answer, they may respond badly, they may say, my agent is looking after this, but they may say, oh, nobody's translating me into English, would you like to do a little bit more and show it to me? Um, it's a high risk strategy for getting started, but it has worked for some people. Um, also, the, also I, 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 one, one example is one of the most prolific translators of Spanish to English, Peter Bush, who got his first translation just by sending 50 pages of uh, Juan Goytisolo's memoirs to Juan Goytisolo, and Goytisolo said, please keep working on this, I'll work out the details with my agent. Sorry, Yasser, please continue. Oh, the Guizolo is a... <laughs> he's an uh, Arabic, Arab. Yeah, yeah, and he is, he is like a hippie guy, a very hippie guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, also, there's a solution is to translate someone who's very old uh, from yeah. the past. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. also a good thing. doesn't need a permission in, in the public yes. domain, like... Uh, yes. A writer from the beginnings of the 20th century or from the 19th century, there's a lot of stuff from China, from Spain, yeah. from Egypt, but not translated from uh, into yeah. English from the, the classics of the yeah. beginnings. And of the if you, I, I totally agree, yes, sir. Uh, if you are, for example, uh, working in the Italian English uh, or Italian French uh, combi language combination, there are a lot of Italian uh, novels, novellas, short fiction, uh, short stories yeah. of the early 20th century that have not been published in English. Yeah. That have not this is the case of Italy. Imagine Hungary, for example, or imagine Egypt. And yeah. Yes, I teach Italian mm. language, Italian literature, sorry, Italian lit literature in English translation. And sometimes I cannot find the works that I would like to, uh, to work on uh, yeah, with my students. Mm. Oh, I should email you. <laughs> mm. 
anyway. So the books in public domain are there's a, an open treasure for everybody who wants to yeah. see something. Yeah. yeah. Especially the classic that nobody. Uh, yeah. That's good mm -hmm. advice. Yeah. 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 So I'm really glad because that was the question. So all these answers have been encased in this question is what advice would you give to an emerging literary translator? And there you have it. We had all this. <laughs> yes. But so I think it's time for us to start saying our goodbyes. I think it was a, a great discussion. I thank you very much. And I would like Lele to just say final words and anything else that you want to say. <laughs> Yeah, you know what, before uh, we uh, jump to the closing remarks, I just have a question, you know, still going on in my mind about the possibility of collaborating with foreign publishers. I don't know how to, how can we go beyond, uh, you know, publishing uh, just the Canadian literature. Uh, it's something that's going on, especially, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, all of us uh, maybe have the experience of translating from uh, literature outside Canada. So is it possible at all uh, to build, you know, partnerships with foreign publishers um, to um, generate more translated literature uh, in, in a Canadian landscape or, you know, global English um, uh, language speaking uh, sphere? So um, Stephen, do you have something? Uh, like there, there certainly are cases where that happens, but it happens over time as people get to know each other. So you can trace relationships between press X in Europe and press Y in North America, and you notice that they trade books back and forth. You get it also, you see certain similar connections between certain presses in Quebec and certain presses in Southern Ontario. Um, and uh, who will some trade books back and forth. Uh, but in every case that I'm aware of, that has happened through personal connections and over quite a long time. Mm. So it's a tough, it's a tough. Yeah. So I don't know if it's something you can legislate or promote or campaign for. I think it's more something that is, is a product of, of people being interested in similar things and they work on one book together and then and then so we translated your book into English oh we've got this writer here and we really think French readers would like this writer will you take a look at it and think and then they sort of can start going back and forth but it's it's very difficult to make that happen it just sort of has to happen I think mm. And uh, thank you. And Luciana, do you have any experience working with foreign publishers? Um, uh, well, not but conversations like what Stephen is saying, for instance. So, so one practical advice, like I'm a complete newbie. <laughs> I uh, had the chance to talk to uh, Argentinian publishers in my case. There was this event organized by the Argentinian embassy and they sent me information and so I got to be on mailing lists and one of them contacted me and it was you know a relatively well-known publisher and we got to converse so you never know where those relationships go but it's just a meet and greet at first so maybe Lele in your case or I don't know uh, if your country has a fair uh, and there are publishers there and then you know you contact other publishers, but it's publisher to publisher in this case. I'm not sure how are you asking it. If you're asking as a translator, if it's translator to translator, how does it work? Because in my case, if I was just wearing my small proto publisher hat, that's it, nothing yeah. else, right? Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I'm asking because I've been noticing a growing or increasingly interest in producing translated literature from within China. So, mm. and they are also, you know, uh, giving awards and uh, financially sponsored uh, translation uh, mm. uh, subject, uh, project, sorry. Uh, so I kind of, you know, I want to imagine the possibility of working collaboratively, uh, collaboratively with um, those literary- I would say that at those levels, it's the association of publishings Publishers, sorry, from the different countries, maybe? The Association of Canadian Publishers, is there a similar one? I'm not sure, I, I'm really seriously not. I think it's, it's, it's through the governmental or the public uh, project of, 
of publishing translations. Like we have in Egypt, in Kuwait, in uh, United Arab Emirates, and in China, the state uh, finance the publishing of, of Chinese literature into other languages and finance also the, the foreign literature to be translated into Chinese. So the, those governmental uh, entities can collaborate with the publishers here in Canada or vice versa. But between two publishers, two house of publishing, I think it's, uh, there's no really such such thing. I think that, uh, it's not helpful. Like two weak parts, you need a strong part too. <laughs> yeah, we have a, ve a very bad saying in Arabic, it's like it's a relationship between a dead guy and, and a sick guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so, but so, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Do you guys want to answer one more question? Or is that unfair to ask? I want to ask Ariana. Tired? I want to yes. ask Ariana. Uh, Yes. Question where her novel was published in Arabic, in which it, country? It hasn't been published yet. It will be published soon uh, by the um, uh, Center for Translation, uh, uh, the National Center for Translation in, in, Cai in Cairo. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is one of the projects I, uh, I'm talking about, <laughs> the governmental project of right. publishing the foreign literature and foreign books in general. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations. Who's the translator? Uh, she, her name is Marwa Mamdou Salem. I don't know whether you know Marwa her. Marwa Mamdou Salem? Ma Marwa Mamdou mm -hmm. Salem. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. They take okay. their times to publish the books. Yeah, so be, be patient. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> the contract says 24 months. <laughs> Anyway, so Leili, your final words? Okay, so let's wrap up. You know, this is a great discussion about the important things. Um, you know, I hope um, um, uh, the members of both Writers Guild of Alberta and um, Literary Translators Association of Canada will benefit from today's discussion. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I really appreciate everybody's uh, contribution and um, yeah. Uh, and, and I want to say, you know, this is the first big event, a translation, translation related event for me. So for me, this is uh, a New Year's gift. <laughs> and today is also my birthday. So it's also my birthday. <laughs> so yeah. And thank you, Luciana, for oh. moderating uh, the panel. No worries. It was uh, a pleasure. Thank you, thank you for uh, organizing all this and for allowing us to to say, I mean, to express our, you know, our ideas here and uh, our, and also to provide our experience uh, for emerging young uh, translators. So we wish a, them all the best. Yes, we do. Yeah. Thank you very it's much. It's a pleasure to see all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. All right, bye, bye now. Oh, bye. 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 Bye.